はい<笑> Where the credit is due A Hollywood icon's connection to the Credit River Valley A bit of a prologue、uh, My name's Rob I grew up in Calum I currently live in Calum It's about an hour just northwest of Toronto maybe 45 minutes Uh, it's an area of profound、uh, environmental beauty.、Uh, it was an area, it's on what's called the Niagara Escarpment,、uh, big kind of ridge that goes all the way from Niagara all the way up to,、uh, I guess it goes all the way to、uh, Wisconsin, actually.、Um, very you know, nice area、uh, to, to live in,、uh, kind of room, under the threat right now of urban sprawl,、uh, right now, gravel pits, because.、Uh, The, the ice age that came in the last ice age created you know, these, these huge valleys and, and this、uh, uh, great landscape. However, also deposited a lot of gravel and sand, which、um, are currently being quarried. So、uh, there's one currently just、uh, next to the current small、uh, provincial park、uh, that's being proposed. So I thought a national park to, to protect the area would be a great idea. Uh, and when you look for you know, something like that, you always want somebody、uh, to, to famous to kind of back it. So,、uh, because of Calvin Hockley, I guess the, the villain named in Titanic,、uh, I thought, hey, well, maybe James Cameron、uh, has a connection to the area. He's a very famous environmentalist you know, with Avatar 2 coming out, so maybe he'd、uh, speak on its behalf.、Right? And now, one thing I also want you to, to kind of carry with you during this presentation is. Is the idea of dreams.、Uh, and, and James Cameron's idea of dreams, primarily that you know, most of Cameron's films,、uh, from you know, his own admission, of, have come to him via dreams.、Uh, and that you know, he himself feels that there's no universally accepted theory on where dreams come from or how they're created, but、uh, he sees it more as an、uh, underlying AI、uh, that most you know, you know, kind of originate your subconscious. And from information that you've both experienced and learned, right?、Uh, so, with that, we'll go chapter one True Lies.、Uh, so, we're talking about James Cameron,、uh, director, screenwriter, and creator of three of the four biggest movies of all time, as well as Terminator,、uh, The Abyss,、uh, True Lies,、uh, Aliens, obviously Avatar. Uh, and Titanic as well.、Uh, you might know him from his environmentalism.、Uh, he's a, a noted vegan,、um, has several farms throughout the, the world that are all very organic.、Um, you might also know him from his uh, exploration. Uh, he actually built the submarine that went to the bottom of the Mariner Trench. Uh, <laughs> Mariner Trench,、uh, he's actually one of a couple of people. Uh, two of them have actually done that. He's、uh, explored lots of shipwrecks, found a lot of、uh, things. So、uh, he's a pretty noted explorer as well、uh, within the ocean. Again, I know him because of Cal and Hockley.、Uh, because in Titanic, he named the villain、uh, Cal Hockley, or Cal and Hockley,、uh, after you know, the town of Cal and、uh, Hockley Valley, which is located just next to、uh, the town of Cal.、Uh, so what is James Cameron's connection、uh, to Calvin? Well, his parent, you know, James was born in, in 1954 in Capus Casey、uh, to Philip and Shirley.、Uh, they were both from Alton, Ontario, which is a village within Calvin.、Uh, his paternal great 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 grandfather, John Cameron, immigrated from Scotland in 1825.、Uh, and Cameron spent summers on this grandfather's farm in southern Ontario.、Uh, the Camerons moved to Niagara when. Uh, James was five. And then later, when James finished high school, they moved to、uh, the Los Angeles, Southern California area、uh, before, I think, moving to Wisconsin and then back to、uh, Southern California for good.、Um, and this is all the information off of Wikipedia, right?、Uh, so, with that, though, I, I looked at it and said, well, obviously, his, his great 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 grandfather、uh, came a long time ago. So, in 1825,、um, let's kind of look at what that. So, I went to his biography、uh, by Rebecca Keegan、uh, called The Futurist.、Uh, in, in it, it, it talks more about you know, that、uh, great 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 grandfather 
that he was actually a Jacobist and that, you know, they kind of came over uh, in that purge, you know, during the 1820s of, of Scotland, of, uh, you know, a bunch of Jacobites and, and they kind of went to different, you know, kind of areas, whether it be Australia or to, to in this case, to Canada. Um, so with that uh, kind of information in hand and, and kind of reading more, you know, about uh, his relationship with this farm as well, um, it doesn't, though, note where it is. Um, so I looked in the area um, and found the, the great ancestry or I think find a grave or something. <clears throat> uh, his great, 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 great grandfather, which is uh, John Cameron. Uh, John Cameron came over in, you know, 1825 and he had, you know, I think about nine kids. I think there was about six that survived. Uh, three ultimately uh, stayed in the area. Um, one of them being James Cameron's great, great, great grandfather, uh, Duncan Cameron. Uh, Duncan, uh, in all the way down through the Cameron family, um, you know, farmed this, this, this area. Uh, so with that in hand, I, I set out to kind of look for where the farm might be because this farms, you know, aren't necessarily like residential houses where they change hands, you know, regularly. Um, you know, farms stay in families. So uh, back after Confederation in Canada in 1867, uh, there was a survey commission for, you know, all of uh, Canada. So this is the survey from about 18... Uh, 72, I believe, and you know you can see just north of this area, Cataract, um, James Cameron, Duncan Cameron, uh, and more to the side as well, uh, the, the Hugh Cameron. So you can see that this area, the the Cameron's uh, uh, family kind of lived in. Now I'd later be able to uh, go back and, and verify this through um, uh, 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 municipal uh, records. Uh, that it is uh, the, uh, that land that uh, the Camerons lived on, which was very surprising for me uh, when I found this out, because on that exact land is the exact land that the quarry is proposed that I'm trying to stop, or that I would like to stop, uh, because it would be right in the middle of this national park proposal that I would like to do. So I found the coincidence that it's, you know, the, the person that I'm looking to, to get to support this is actually directly linked to, to the, you know, the, the, the cause at hand, I found was stunning. Because when you look at it, it's the same sort of uh, thing that's going on in Avatar, this, you know, massive quarrying of this kind of pristine area. And, you know, the similarities were you know, just shocking to me. When I looked into how it became this, uh, it, I guess it turns out that in the mid 90s, uh, the neighboring developers uh, who had built golf courses uh, began the processing of buying up uh, farms in the area. Now, Cameron started writing Avatar in the mid 90s, in 1995. Um, and Cameron's villain in Avatar is a mining executive that golfs. Uh, so the developers that are building the golf course, you know, on the surrounding lands are now the ones that are actually mining uh, the thing. So to be, you know, blunt, it was, you know, life imitating art in a way. Um, which then got me thinking. If the land maybe, you know, or the area did mean a lot to him, because it is a, the, the, the area in which the farm is, is very unique. Um, you know, why would you necessarily just have, you know, when you're writing this movie, name the villain after it, right? Like maybe the, the area, you're both your parents are from the village, you settled the village 200 years ago. Um, you know, why are you, why are you doing, why are you doing them dirty like that? Because there must always be, in good writing, there must always be some sort of balance in the story, right? So if you're going to name the villain after your hometown or your, you know, your home, you know, your, your, where your heritage is from, might you not do the same with the hero as well? Because the truest lie is really not saying anything at all about where you get the inspiration for things. Because this is Joseph Dawson, and now he was on the Titanic. Uh, he died when it went down 
Um, there's a grave marker in Halifax um, at the, the, the Titanic graveyard. And like millions of people go here and leave flowers. For a guy that has no connection to the story at all, um, you know, this was kind of learned probably after the movie came out, even. I think that was the, the coincidence of it. Um, so I thought, well, let's take a look at, you know, Jack Dawson. Who is this Jack Dawson, right? When you read into it, you look at it, Jack is really Jim. Um, you know, Jack Dawson grew up ice fishing and trout fishing in his native Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Uh, well, the Niagara Escarpment runs from Niagara all the way to Wisconsin. His parents lived in Wisconsin for a bit. He didn't, but he grew up in Chippewa. Uh, you know, the, the town of Chippewa just just five minutes, you know, away from Niagara Falls. Uh, and again, Niagara Falls and, and nearby the nearby the farm is a Cataract Falls. Um, would have served as kind of a direct inspiration for, you know, naming his background Chippewa Falls. Um, you know, James Cameron would have grew up fishing on the lake in the river next to the farm. Um, Chippewa is where James Cameron lived. Um, you know, it would have been that kind of uh, inspiration for, you know, being that age back in that time. Uh, you know, both Jack and James moved to California at age 17. Uh, and they're both, you know, they both drew portraits of people. Um, you know, that, that's kind of what they would do. And then, obviously... You know, in their 20s, you know, they kind of take off. Uh, and that's kind of James's life story, right? Um, so it even mentions when he's drawing, because that's uh, him drawing the, the, the portrait of Rose, um, that he did it and he was creating the character through, or doing the artwork at least, through the eyes of Jack uh, at that age and at that time. So he's obviously already been able to be in that mindset because I think he's written the character as an homage. It's a, you know, fictional biography of himself. Um, kind of what it would have been like at that time. So I went and looked to see if there was anybody. And there was in the graveyard, in, in the local graveyard, um, you know, close to this farm, there's a John Dawson because John Dawson would have been Jack Dawson's real name, right? His name, birth name wouldn't be Jack, it would have been John. Um, so I thought, well, that's that's a crazy coincidence, right? That, you know, that, you know close to this farm uh, where he's named the villain, Cal Mahockley, uh, that, you know, there's, a, there's an actual person named after the, <clears throat> the hero in this story, uh, Jack Dawson. So I decided I would have to go to the cemetery to find out, to see if this is true. So when I did, uh, I went to the cemetery and I couldn't find Jack Dawson. He wasn't in the cemetery. There are, he's listed as buried in the cemetery. Um, there are uh, a couple of missing headstones uh, just in this area uh, without markers, so unsure. Um, the, the picture here on the left, uh, is the first grave I came across. That's of James Cameron. That would have been uh, James Cameron's great uncle or great great uncle, uh, possibly. I guess it's one of those. Um, he died actually uh, like a year, or was either a year to the day or uh, a day after or something like that of Titanic, which is kind of a weird coincidence. Um, but I thought I was kind of dejected and I, I turned around and I found the actual cenotaph for Cameron's direct line. And this would be his great grandfather and his great great grandfather and, and you know their children and those sorts of things all buried on, under this one. And this is the the, the actual Cameron's uh, family cenotaph. Uh, behind the, the cenotaph, you'll see a couple of graves. Um, that's towards the exit. And as I started walking out, um, I got closer to, to one of them. You know, I'm kind of dejected. I haven't really found Jack Dawson. You know, that kind of link towards, you know, the movie. Uh, it's just not there until I come across and I finally see what's behind there. Because it's the Titanic family. I didn't really know what to think at this point. Um, I thought somebody was joking. Like, I thought it was a joke, I guess. Right? Um, 
because, oh, you know, James Cameron's grandparents, you know, 20 feet from them. Now there's a Titanic gravesite. Oh, I mean, I guess, you know, somebody's a big fan because it's a fairly new looking gravesite, gravestone. And when I look down in the grave markers of the, uh, you know, the, of the, on the ground, um, you can tell, though, that it's been there for a while. Like the family, though, has a, a plot there. And next to it is romantic. So I thought, oh, that's weird, romantic Titanic, right? Isn't that funny? And just as a coincidence, between the, the next one over, the next graves over are crisp and bacon. So it's, it's a funny little graveyard here, right? With crisp bacon and romantic Titanic, you know, 20 feet from the, the cameras. Um, but then I realized, it, it dawned on me that this is actually an old grave because uh, the, the the grave on the name on the other side um, is somebody else, but they're related to the Titanic family. So I thought this is weird. And when we checked the records, um, there was no records of the Titanic family being buried there, but that would have, I guess, meant that it would have been prior to 1930 um, through, the, through the cemetery records. So, the family, there would have been a headstone, there, and you, I think you can see remnants of one underneath the, the new one, uh, but there would have been an old Titanic grave here uh, back a long time ago. So I thought, come on, that's way too much of a coincidence, right? So I started looking around the cenotaph in the, the family grave again to see what I could find, if there were any other kind of links or, you know, any other jack uh, but I did find a considerable amount of names linked to Cameron characters and in, in throughout movies, um, as well as some, you know, visual iconography um, that comes from major uh, things with, with his films. Um, so with that, I thought, well, I better start reading more about James Cameron because there's a, an incredible amount of coincidences because this cemetery is only located about a kilometer away uh, from the family farm. Um, so it, it would have been somewhere that, you know, at some point he probably would have stumbled in. So with that, we'll go to chapter two, which is the abyss. So you stare too long in the abyss, it stares right back at you. This is kind of where I, I really started getting into reading a lot more, you know, kind of, now I've uh, got to read, you know, all of kind of James Cameron's uh, kind of biography now. I'm not just kind of seeing what's going on in the, you know, those early days where he's kind of living, you know, the teenager on the farm. Um, you start getting into a lot of kind of those 80s and 90s uh, stories. And one of the ones that kind of, kind of comes up is, you know, James Cameron in plagiarism suits. Uh, you know, one of them, you know, the, the, I guess the most kind of famous of it uh, is maybe Harlan Ellison. Uh, through Terminator, um, but there's, you know, he's been sued hundreds and hundreds of times for plagiarism, uh, and he wins, uh, but it, you know, basically there, it came to a head in 2012 um, when somebody was suing him over, you know, over the origins of Avatar or, or where those sorts of things are. Now, that prompted Cameron to, to put forth a 45-page declaration, you know, an affidavit, basically, you know, detailing where he came up with the concept for the film. And he'd said he'd been kicking around the ideas he'd had since he was a child. He said he's been pulling together elements of Avatar almost all his life. When he was 11th grade, he did a pen drawing titled, entitled Spring on Planet Florida, which he says became the concept behind the alien jungle landscape on the moon of Pandora, where Avatar takes place. Now, one another coincidence is on the first name that you can see on this cenotaph and the, the family cenotaph is Flora Cameron. Um, again, just one more coincidence linking, uh, you know, this graveyard to uh, inspiration uh, behind. Uh, in his own words, he says, in writing Avatar, I've had many other reference points and uh, sources of inspiration. It'd be impossible to name them all. Uh, in addition to those previously mentioned, my reference points were uh, diverse from serious films about Europeans or Americans and immersing in indigenous cultures, such as Lawrence of Arabia or The Man Who Would Be King. He also goes on to say 
uh, also include her widely known historical stories uh, of Pocahontas and Sacagawea uh, and such. Um, but he, he kind of ends with, I have described Avatar in numerous interviews as my most personal film. And by this, I mean that the themes and ideas of the film are the most personal tome of any I've done. In this declaration, I've demonstrated that the ideas, themes, and the very conceptual fabric of Avatar is innate to me based on a systematically developed pattern of artwork, story concepts, interests, and activities beginning in my elementary school days and stretching forward through high school, college, and my earliest career as a writer and filmmaker. So with that in mind, I'm now looking at uh, kind of things through, because he, he's being in this area now uh, as a teenager through, you know, you got to look at it through the eyes of a teenager in the 1960s. Um, and when you start doing that, there are a lot of similarities between the Niagara Escarpment and the area that uh, he uh, spent time at growing up on the farm uh, and the world of Avatar. Um, so after reading his biography, uh, I went to the next book which was Technoir, because after uh, the 2012 uh, lawsuits and the affidavits, uh, a lot of film historians and, and art experts came to him and said, hey, you know, do you have all these drawings? Uh, and he said, yeah, I got boxes. He's kept half of what he's ever drawn. Um, so he's got boxes and boxes of things. And they began pouring through everything uh, and, you know, basically making the conclusion that, you know, there's all of this earliest framework is is the natural evolution into all of you know your great works um and he throughout the book will comment on on artwork and what it meant to him and why he made it and, and various things like that so with that you know what i'm trying to look at is you know did he actually spend any time here in that farm and was it of, of influence um you know, because he's talking, you know, 1968, you know, is when he saw uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. And that's a movie that really uh, inspired him to become a filmmaker. Um, you know, one of the other things that's kind of happening as well at that time, this is mentioning that he's watching, you know, the, the landing of Apollo 11 uh, at the farm. Um, and that's, you know, that's also a, a big influence on, you know, this exploration that he wants to get into. Uh, storytelling and, and exploration uh, as a as a 14 you know 13 14 15 year old kid so looking at it you know through that eyes of, of a kid you know spending time in 60s Calvin, uh the distance from the farm to you know what this you know, provincial park uh, currently is and you know really an area of uh, outstanding natural beauty is only about a kilometer away uh, you can see this little village of cataract uh, has a few houses in it uh, but not really a village village. Uh, that would be more Alton, which is located just, you know, maybe uh, a kilometer or two uh, north of, of this Kofipo, right? Uh, and as you can see, uh, just north of the Force of the Credit uh, Park here, you see a kind of a gravel pit, right? Um, and that's you know, something that's definitely very much in, in kind of encroaching on that area. So when I open the book and I start looking at the book, you know, obviously I'm looking for this, you know, hopeful connection uh, to the area. I was kind of blown away by the first one because this is a uh, drawing that James Cameron did uh, when he was 12 years old. And it's a very good drawing for a 12 year old. I mean, you can obviously see the, the, the artist, you know, the artistic merit coming out uh, and him practicing uh, different shavings and all those sorts of things. The thing that was shocking though to me is that I've seen this because I grew up in Calum, and those are real planes. They haven't flown in a long time, but during the 80s, when I was a kid, they did. So if they did it during the 80s, they would have did it during the 60s. Those planes are parked about 10 minutes, 15 minutes drive south of the farm at a World War I uh, airplane museum. Um, and yeah, they, would have flown over top of of the farm all the time in the 60s and and you can see where even you know the the 12 and the 17 well maybe you know as i say it's not that great but you know even down to the you know the details 
um, those are pretty direct representations, especially when you consider uh, the the background that they're flying over. Uh, now, if you take a look at kind of the background, it's it's you know the the you know what they're flying over. It's kind of this river valley. Um, you know the way the river kinks is exactly the way it kind of does down you know by terracotta the village as you can kind of see down in the you know the farm or or something down there um in this kind of idea of, of kind of hills or mountains off on the distance um that's obviously through Kelt mountain and the niagara escarpment which are just south of of you know this is what this river will run into and, and down into waterfalls uh south of this this farm so you know um definitely you know something that he's drawing um, directly from from real life, um, and this will you know this this idea of of kind of biplanes and these these early sketchworks you know kind of play up right throughout throughout high school. Um, so I immediately went to you know the the drawing that you know kind of launched Avatar, which is springtime in Florida. Um, now, when I saw it, I was again immediately kind of knocked back because the forests in which surround the 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 farm are all old growth um, maple forests now you know one of the things about that is you know these trees are all like a hundred feet tall minimum um they're old growth they're very big uh they're very you know the the vines that kind of come through uh on the forest floor in this area um are incredibly huge yes yeah, so you're going to see all these kind of vines and big big tall trees so to me it's not really an alien world i'm seeing the the forest that surrounds uh this farm that james cameron would have uh spent a ton of time at right uh when you start looking at the the geology of the the world you know the this kind of alien worlds that he's creating uh you know the stratification of the the rock is very very similar to you know the what it looks like here on the niagara escarpment um, as you can see, you know, the, the branches and the vines, you know, you definitely get that uh, in this, you know, specific area. You don't get it, you know, five kilometers to the west, and five kilometers to the east, anywhere else, but it runs like a ribbon all the way down, uh, you know, for really about, you know, eight, nine hundred kilometers, I think it is. Um, you know, this unique Niagara scarp, you know, and tying it back again, you know, you have this iconography in, in the cemetery. Um, you know, the weeping willows and those sorts of things that really do kind of, in, you know, kind of emulate almost exactly the, the, the tree of souls that he's creating, um, you know, to be really the, the, you know, one of the central tenements of, of Avatar. Even in his, you know, the, the other artworks that he's doing as a kid, you know, he's drawing, you know, kind of Conan and, and, you know, these kind of cavemen things, you know, they're, you know, the rocky kind of areas that they're, they're in are very, very similar to, you know, the tops of, you know, these, you know, the, the Niagara Scarpment and the, and the karst formations that, you know, it kind of creates. So again, the, the landscape is, is definitely something that you're kind of seeing kind of come through that's, you know, directly around this. Um, you know, one of the kind of the, 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 the things I came across was his retelling of War of the Worlds and he kind of created it just, you know, very similar to, to how he's influenced by other things. He took direct influence from, you know, uh, the War of the Worlds and, and told it as his own story. Uh, in his, the war machines rose out of the sand pit, wielding their deadly heat rays to begin their conquest of man. Well, you know, they, you know why would maybe a sand pit be something? Um, you know, back in the 1960s, uh, the, the pits were starting to start up. Um, they were primarily gravel and sand pits. So, uh, James Cameron definitely would have had experience and, and know uh, about, you know, because he's uh, close proximity to these gravel and, and sand pits, which his farm now is destined to, to become one of. Um, and as you can see, as kind of time goes on, they get bigger and bigger as, as, as history. Um, one thing that you want to, it, it's, you know, the, we're actually, I'm working with the, the archives right now to, to get hopefully an actual picture of the house. Uh, there was a dome house in the cataract. Uh, it was a weird, weird looking house. Um, it looked very similar to, to kind of this sort of house, uh, uh, but it was perched pretty much right on uh, the top of this kind of escarpment cliff that looks over the valley 
uh, and in front of it is is all these kind of fields, right? Um, I think that's uh, important as, as you start looking at you know the the artwork that he's creating, you know during these teenage years, he's you know showing these geodesic domes that are are are, are kind of popping up now. You know, one of the things is, you know, 1960s, 1967, especially, you know, with, with Expo 67, you're seeing this, this dome sort of culture anyway. And, you know, it's primarily why the house was built in the first place, but it definitely would have been a, a you know, a prominent local landmark very close to James Cameron's uh, farm that definitely would have brought it. I know it because I used to live in Bakersfield. So uh, <laughs> this, is lo this is a photograph. Uh, it's a photo uh, taken across the street from where the dome house would, you know, was. It's now uh, uh, somebody else's house, but then they kind of read, you know, knocked it down and put up a uh, very nice house. So, um, but this is the landscape uh, on the other side, you know, between uh, the Cameron uh, house and, you know, this dome house. Uh, and as you can see, you know, the, there's a lot of, of you know, kind of similarities. You know, if you take out the spaceship and the blue woman and the the robot, um, you can see where it's it's a very similar landscape. Um, maybe if you don't notice, actually, there's a guy in the clouds actually grabbing onto that. I never really noticed that, but um, you know, kind of the with the hills in the background, behind that, you know, the dome house was on the cliff. Those those mountainous backgrounds, or hilly backgrounds, at least, um, uh, kind of being influenced. Now, one thing, uh, kind of drawings that he had done that aren't in Technoir, uh, was, I came across, was uh, his fascination, you know, the deep sea, which started in kind of 1969. Uh, and this is a kind of story that came out of Toronto Life, where the film, film maker was just 14, uh, living in Niagara Falls, when he saw the habitat uh, on display. Now, this was a, a kind of deep sea uh the station that had been built uh that was going to be tested in, in 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 the great lakes um and james cameron became you know enamored with it he drew it and started writing back and forth with these uh these explorers and these lead scientists as a kid right uh and they're saying you know there's something special about the the letter the energy the confidence uh so i answered and sent him a blueprint and he never forgot that and you know he's kindly created you know credited me with inspiring him to become a diver uh, so, you know, that kind of 1969 area, uh, you know, he's kind of 14, 13, 14, 15. He's really starting, you know, in Jacques Cousteau's on TV, uh, started getting involved in that, you know, deep sea. Now, was that partly because there's also a Titanic link, uh, you know, that he's kind of come, you know, stumbled across this Titanic grave. And maybe that's something that's kind of driving his, you know, want to explore the deep sea. Maybe because, uh he writes the abyss at age 17 um you know in this exploration it, it kind of comes up with the story for the abyss um and years later bob ballard finds the titanic and he's watching you know the titanic uh footage from national geographic on tv and he, he realizes i gotta change the abyss and now he's he, he rewrites it and uh later he'll go on to to make titanic as well um, because you got to ask you know, maybe the question. In the 1960s, the Titanic was gone. It was missing, right? That's why Bob Ballard was everybody looking for it. Uh, was Titanic maybe James Cameron's own quest? Like, is that something that he wanted to find? Uh, you know, why he got it, you know, so interested in the, uh, the deep sea. So, um, because when he started really exploring and understanding or, or kind of, uh, researching more about, watching more about the, the deep sea, learn more about the bioluminescence of the deep sea, right? And uh, that was something that he used to, to basically combine the two worlds, uh, you know, of, of, of what he's seeing, which is the terrestrial world and, and the, you know, the giving it that bioluminescence. Uh, so you can kind of see where his progression of artwork goes, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, rocky and, and kind of planet, you know, to, to this now influence of, of the bioluminescence. And one thing you have to remember as well is that, you know, Mike Cameron, his brother, was also very involved in the abyss and Titanic as well, because he was the one that 
Uh, I've developed the hardware to actually film the, the stuff, right? Uh, you know, Jim you know, was the one that made the dives and, and did the filming, but it was Mike Cameron's technology that, that made it possible, right? So, you know, could the idea to make the abyss was, was partially in part to, to prove that he can make Titanic, maybe? Uh, you know, Ballard had already found it, so now was it something that he wanted to film for his epic? Uh, because just like Titanic, uh, in Avatar, the Abyss required Cameron to create, you know, technology to make the films themselves. So, you know, it really is uh, kind of a family effort on making uh, on, on making some of these movies for the camera. Which I guess brings us back to the plot. Uh, you know, what does it, you know, it, you know, we, uh, there's obviously you know, some sort of influences uh, that are going on there. You know, uh, James Cameron himself is, is saying that, it's the nature uh, that he's experiencing at that time that's directly influencing uh, things. So, you know, we are able to, to kind of connect James Cameron now to this farm at various points uh, throughout his life that, that were an influence. So how does that really, you know, kind of the, you know, look when it, when it comes to, to Avatar? So part three, aliens. So at this point, I've seen a lot of coincidences in this, right? Whether it be the type of romantic Titanic being married, you know, buried next to uh, James Cameron's grandparents, to uh, the the quarry going on the the, the farm, um, you know, that they were Jacobites and, and possibly even you know Upper Canada rebels and all these sorts of things. It really, I mean, if you've never seen the the Skip Virus, um, yeah, it kind of got to that point. So looking at it, I, I kind of had to say, okay, where, you know, there, why was he even there in the Was he there to go see, you know, Chris Bacon, you know, buried next to him and he stumbled across the Titanic? Or was it one of those stories? Because, you know, there are family stories that are obviously being told through uh, and passed down through the camera family history. You know, is Chris Bacon and, and Titanic just another one of them? Uh, as you see the progression of his artwork in, in tech noir, uh, he does, you know, he starts to create uh, the, the, the idea for this, this story, uh, Mother, right, which is now you're kind of getting into this sentient world and, and which really will now develop into, to, uh, to, you know, Pandora and Avatar itself. Um, you know, he says the idea for, for the, the blue aliens came from uh, a six-breasted, nine-foot version of a blue alien woman that his mother had his dream about so uh he said that's where he kind of kind of crafted that idea from um next we'll go to you know where does the floating mountains kind of come from uh the idea of the floating mountains uh, you know the, the the idea behind it is that they're magnetic because one of the things that james cameron does like to do is you know bind everything together with actual science he tries to to be as as uh exact as he can um a good actually uh you know example of that is using the stars the, the correct stars uh, as they would have been seen in the sky during titanic which was you know a nice small detail but that's kind of what james cameron does in his world building uh is really work on kind of the details so the idea that the mountains float is because they're magnetic um Caledon Mountain is very famous for being an optical illusion, though, uh, but as a magnetic hill. Um, and definitely during the 1960s, as a teenager, uh, James Cameron would have experienced uh, the, mag the magnetic hills of Caledon. Uh, and one of the other things, the, the, the farm itself was called Farview Farm. And one of the things is, is it is high up on the escarpment. Uh, and you can see for a, for a long, long distance, just based on uh, because Lake Ontario is uh, about you know seventy kilometers away, uh, based on the altitude. And as you can see, the Niagara Escarpment pop up over the horizon uh, for many, many, many miles. And you know you get in the during the summers when you get the the river valley kind of fogs up, it does give that impression of kind of floating mountain tops. So uh, you can definitely see where. You know, there may have been that kind of uh, uh, inspiration for the floating there. Now, one of the things, again, with the Camerons is this idea that they came to Canada in the 1820s. Uh, and that was 10 years before the Upper Canada Rebellion. Uh, they were definitely, you know, 
Caledon itself is the, the Roman term, the Latin term for Scotland. Uh, most of, most if not many, of the, uh, the residents, the original settlers in Caledon were of Scottish descent, all primarily from the same area and all primarily Jacobites. Um, however, the, the land that they cleared and had been given uh, previously belonged to the indigenous Mississauga of the Credit. Um, now, there's a strong possibility that they would have supported and possibly engaged in the rebellion of Upper Canada. Uh, and we kind of know this because their family stories have been handed down. It's shown in Cameron's father's you know, uh, interview uh, in The Futurist, right? So, you know, where he talks about uh, that he's, you know, retelling uh, those colonialist, uh, co you know, colonial stories of, of displacing the indigenous and those sorts of things, you know, his family was directly involved in that. Uh, so is that something that, you know, is really greatly influencing uh, the, the story in it? Uh, because the Mississauga of the Credit uh, belong to, you know, a, a, a larger group of uh, indigenous peoples in, in the Great Lakes area. Um, but one of the stories of theirs, you know, from, from the area is the land surrounding the, 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 the area, kind of uh, the forks of the Credit, is associated with an old Indian or indigenous legend, uh, which tells of a chief's daughter and a brave whose advance as she spurs, uh, and that, you know, there was uh, a lightning bolt created, uh, this, you know, kind of the, the rocky spires and, and the, these karst form, you know, what are called karst formations, these, these kind of rocky spires, uh, that became known as uh, the Devil's Pulpit. Uh, and that's kind of just north of a little village called Brimstone as well. So it's kind of a play on that. Um, but the Mississauga belong to uh, a kind of a greater clan, which is the uh, Anishinaabe. Now, Nabe and Nabe are kind of phonetically similar. And you'll see that kind of James Cameron throughout his life has, you know, lived in this Great Lakes area, whether it be, you know, in, in Kapaskasing, which would be uh, in the area of the Nipissing, uh, or, you know, whether he was in the, uh, you know, grew up in Chippewa, um, or uh, in the Forks area, which would be, uh, you know, the area of the, the Mississauga. So he's understanding and kind of, he would have known about um, the, the, the Ojibwe kind of uh, culture in the 1960s. Um, through, uh, now, when you look at the mythology of uh, the Ojibwe uh, culture, um, one of them is the fabled water panther. And it has head and paws of a giant cat, but it's covered in scales and has dagger-like spikes. Uh, you know, that's, looks a lot like in kind of the influence of, of you know, possibly being influenced uh, by the indigenous cultures of Southern Ontario. Uh, you know, when you start looking at, you know, one of the, one of the oddities about the farm is, is that as they, as they create uh, gravel pits in the area and the river valley itself, it does create an immense amount of thermal updrafts and the area is, you know, I don't say littered, but it's a bird watcher's paradise uh, for big uh, carnivorous raptors, I guess. Um, one of them that we, you know, is, is primarily found around Cameron's farm is that of a, a huge amounts of turkey vultures. Uh, now, if you ever come across a turkey vulture um, eating something on the, the road, I mean, their wingspan's about, you know, six, seven feet. So uh, they'll definitely, uh, they're definitely big birds. Um, so you can kind of maybe see maybe where that maybe became an influence uh, because there would, would have been a constant um, overhead presence. Of, of vultures and hawks and eagles uh, around the camera farm. Uh, as you can see, the indigenous culture as well, they have the idea of the Thunderbird, right? Uh, and you kind of you see some of this idea uh, of maybe it's it's the indigenous cultures uh, maybe lending uh, uh, to, to the Cameron's idea because he does say that he has borrowed from numerous uh, indigenous cultures. So here, let's finish this off with part four, the Terminator. So I know it seems weird, but we'll go back to the beginning. Um, so I know that, you know, Calvin Hawkins, right? Calvin Hawkins, down of Calvin Hawkins. How that plays into the history of Upper Canada, um, you know, Caledon was, was first settled in the 1820s uh, after the War of 1812. Uh, different uh, 
uh, uh, tracts of land being purchased from the indigenous. Um, now, when that came to who got the best tracts of land, uh, those were really being given to, to people with you know English descent uh, because there were only a, a few families that were actually in control of all of the you know Upper Canada at that time. Um, so, you know, basically the Camerons in the Scots were given uh, the worst kind of farmland to do, which was, you know, this rocky um, cavernous place. It basically was very similar to the Highlands of Scotland, actually. Now, one of the, you know, things that became a pushback against this, this uh, almost dictatorship in Upper Canada uh, was the push for responsible government. <clears throat> that was from a guy named William Lyon Mackenzie. Now, Mackenzie was a Scot himself, uh, and the Mackenzie clan and the Cameron clan would have uh, been closely aligned. Uh, but he was, you know, going kind of up and down uh, southern Ontario or, or upper Canada at that time, uh, preaching about, uh, you know, kind of overthrowing the government as it were, right? And there's many, many stories of, of Mackenzie and his connection to Calvin as well. Um, and that leads us to the Upper Canada Rebellion in 1837, where 800 men uh, kind of uh, rabble roused their way down Young Street and were met by uh, swift reinforcements of, uh, you know, from the British loyalists, and uh, it was quickly put down. But, you know, several years later, that did lead to, uh, the, you know, the creation of So who was John Graham Dawson and all this then? Uh, well, John Graham Dawson would have immigrated or come to Canada uh, in the 1820s at the same time, he would have been a neighbor of the, you know, kind of one street over, as it were, uh, of, the, of the Camerons. Uh, his mother was uh, Catherine Graham Dawson, uh, daughter of, <coughs> sorry, uh, Colonel Graham uh, of Hockley. So there's that Hockley kind of name connection. Um, his father was Richard Dawson, who was a noted Irish peer and was elected, I think, uh, what, six times, five, uh, successive parliaments. He was a very noted uh, anti-unionist, so he was someone who would would have been against the crown as well. Uh, John uh, Dawson's son fought in the U.S. Civil War, actually, uh, and he would have been in his 40s during the Upper Canada Rebellion, so he's probably somebody that uh, would have at least been aware and probably would have been involved, uh, if we're going to be, uh, you know, kind of making wild guesses, but um, you know, he would have been, uh, he, he was a, a noted uh, area resident. So yeah, uh, he's a son of peerage. He's, John Cameron was the same way. Uh, John Cameron was uh, uh, like I think the fourth son of, uh, you know, landowners in, in Baltimore, so, which is really the, the, the seat of the Stuart kind of dynasty, right? Um, they would have been neighbors of the Camerons, uh, mother was a but yeah. Now let's get to the middle. So this is going to be like the 1920s, because as you can see, there I may not have noticed so far, but there's a railway that that runs through here, and the railway was put in the 1870s um, to to quarry a lot of the rock from this this you know this prominent rock faces, right? Uh, and that was used to create you know really the the buildings of Toronto. So um, you know where Toronto kind of grew during the you know the 1870s, it, it really came. On the back of the timber and the the stone that had been quarried out of this area, um, you know the railway also though into the city. So you know if you weren't much for the farm life and you wanted to go to the big city, off you'd go. And one of those was actually Jack or John Dawson's neighbor's uh, kid, Arthur Mel or Arthur Houston. Uh, he was a you know he he lived his family uh, had a very large home uh, farmstead in uh, a village called Melville, just north of uh, the Camerons. Um, now, you might not know Arthur Houston. He was a huge vaudeville star. Uh, but him and his cousin had come back to the family farmstead and built a golf course in, in 1920 and a huge kind of estate. And, you know, throughout the years, it would host, you know, tons of celebrities and Hollywood celebrities. It would be huge parties during the Roaring Twenties and uh in, in the 30s and things like that um but the you might know is walter houston now walter houston was in a ton of movies uh during the 30s and the 40s 
uh, in the 50s where he would be directed by somebody he probably know was John Huston. Uh, John Huston, obviously a, a, a very prominent director, uh, and, uh, won several Academy Awards, nominated, I think, for 15. Um, he was also the Danny Houston and Angelica Houston, uh, who have won several awards. Now, uh, when Walter Houston passed away uh, in the early 50s, uh, the, the golf course slash estate was sold uh, to uh, local guys that kind of ran it as a golf course from then. But the history and kind of the local legend and story of, because Bob Hope would play there, uh, Elizabeth Taylor would play there, uh, you know, the people come up from Hollywood and, and visit things like that. So it really was their family kind of homestead. And that kind of would have been local legend uh, to, to James Cameron growing up because it really, you know, it's just on the other side of the village where, where that golf course slash uh, estate would have been. And because there wasn't much to do in the 1960s in the village besides riding down uh, to the general store and maybe get the pop and, a, and an ice cream cone or something like that. Uh, there's not too much else to do besides kind of hike in the area and, and you know, kind of explore all the, 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 the lakes and the rivers and the, the forests that are around it, right? Which brings us to kind of 1963. Uh, now, James is kind of talking about, you know, kind of movies and, and you know, those sorts of things. What Caledon's kind of connection to movies is, is that in 1963, Walt Disney releases The Incredible Journey which is probably, if we're going to be honest, the best Walt Disney movie of all time, that was filmed in Cali. So, you know, a 10-year-old James Cameron, 9-year-old James Cameron, uh, would have kind of known about that. He would have probably watched that movie, I'm going to guess. Um, so, you know, does that kind of create, oh, there's not only this film connection uh, between the Houstons, but there's also... But, um, you know, obviously, John Houston probably... You know, I'm not going to say he was an influence, but, you know, there would have been at least a, a local curiosity if a local guy like Walter Houston can kind of get out and make it huge in, in Hollywood. Maybe he could as well. Um, but in 1966, Walter Houston, or sorry, John Houston releases the Bible, and, and it is a huge, you know, it's a huge epic. Um, and it's got, you know, Noah's Ark is one of the, you know, the kind of the apex of the film, right? This kind of huge epic showing of, 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 of a boat, right? Is that something where... James Cameron's now linking that to the, you know, possible Titanic, you know, kind of interest now and deep sea exploration and who knows, right? I'm just saying, because one of the other films <clears throat> or stories I'm sorry, uh, that made a big influence was uh, The Man Who Would Be King, which is a 1975 film based on uh, the, the Kipling story, but uh, John Huston did that one as well. So here we are at the end. So we've got this area. Uh, the Camerons have been here for 200 years. It's how did the forks of the credit area become Pandora? I mean, <clears throat> if you look at a lot of the uh, <clears throat> excuse me early artwork of James Cameron, it does look uh, a lot like uh, an alien, an alien amped up version of the area around the farm. Um, you know, waterfalls, uh, rock, you know, rocky cliffs, um, you know, weird houses, you know, weird alien landscapes. Uh, it's an inspirational area. I mean, the, the group of seven, um, you know, many members of the group of seven painted, painted here. Uh, you know, it was a huge tourist destination during the 1920s uh, and, and throughout, you know, the, you know, those early days of Canada, right? Um you know, the, the, the fact that the story for Avatar was, you know, come up with at the same time that this area that potentially is the, you know, kind of inspiration for Pandora uh, gets purchased and, and, and with the intent probably of becoming a quarry. Uh, you know, James Cameron would have seen the expansion of quarries all around his family farm. So, uh, you know, it's something definitely that he would have subconsciously known that, you know, it's it's getting sold to developers, and this is kind of what the the end result of is going to be of that, right? Um, now, because really, when you start to look at it, there are really too many coincidences um, of of his uh, spending time in this area and it having some sort of impact on uh, his film career. Um, 
because as he states uh, in his last interview just a couple of weeks ago, uh, that, you know, we all have, you know, this is just to kind of paraphrase what he said, but we have innate programming at a subconscious level with our dreams acting like a generative AI that comes from a vast data set based on our experiences. I don't really remember like a videotape, I'll remember a single image, uh, like beads on a necklace, but it's not just the image. It's the underlying metadata that provides the story. So he's not, you know, I don't know where it came from, but I, yeah, I must have experienced it for it to become, you know, the, the idea that I've, that I've made. And I understand that maybe, you know, he hasn't been there in decades and decades and he maybe hasn't thought about this stuff um, ever since, you know, he was a kid. Uh, but I think there is a, a strong connection, a strong possibility and generally a strong probability uh, that this area does have some sort of uh, an influence on because if that's true the only comparable i can make it to uh would be green gables now for most you know almost all canadians know anna green gables and the you know what you'll find is most people worldwide know anna green gables um in real life you know it, green gables is was the inspiration for the setting of lucy mom montgomery's classic tale of fiction anna green gables in real life the farm was the home of her uncle uh, or who were cousins or something like that. The farm was first settled in 1831 by uh, David McNeil. Although Lucy Montgomery never actually lived there, she grew up nearby with her grandparents and she came to know her cousin's farm for exploration, surrounding woodlands in places she named and discovered, such as Lover's Lane and Hunt. Soon after Anna Green Gables was published in 1908, people began coming to Cavendish in search of Green Gables along with other places and people of the Avonlea setting in the novel. So most of what Montgomery describes in her book was a product of her own creativity, sometimes complemented by the inspiration of a real life setting. And as in her own words, she says Cavendish is to a large extent Avonlea, you know, Green Gables was drawn from David McNeil's house, although not so much the house itself as the situation, the scenery. Uh, and the truth of my description is attested by the fact that everyone has recognized it, right? So to that, I say, Mr. Cameron, I recognize it. So if that's, if I can recognize it, I'm sure others can recognize it too, uh, you know, to, to, to see it as well. Uh, and if that is true, and really you know, Green Gables is a natural park, uh, and that goes a long way to giving the legitimacy uh, to the idea that, yeah, uh, this area is incredibly, uh, not only biodiverse, uh, and it's a, you know, an incredibly important watershed, uh, but that it does have this strong uh, historical culture of inspiration in this area. So my conclusion, that the family farm that Jim spent considerable time at growing up through a combination of family, local and personal history and its surrounding landscape inspired him on a path that would change the world, I guess forever. And that the original wor works of James Cameron have influenced culture to a degree that few have achieved. Those works can be traced back to a singular location. And as such, that area needs to be protected. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this and have yourself a wonderful day.